Coatesville webcast under these unfortunate situations. I'd like to extend my prayers out to each and every one of you out there, uh, especially those of the household of faith and that we hold on to the faith. This is just another test, so we shouldn't marvel at the things that may come about. God always tells you to trust in him. He's going he's gonna to win, and, and we know the end of the story and how this ends. So we aren't to faint or lose heart, but just keep on the fine line. And for all the preachers out there, so-called preachers, true preachers out there, this is an opportunity, an opportunity to preach Jesus, as all opportunities. But every event that happens in the world, we should, as preachers, should see an opportunity to preach Jesus. Now people are looking for ways, looking for answers. Many people out there looking for a, a stimulus check. We already have the stimulus plan. God always had the stimulus plan. And we must follow that plan and tell those that are lost to follow this plan. God is the God of the living and the dead. And I'm talking spiritually. I'm not talking physically. There are some that are the walking dead. They're alive physically, but spiritually they're dead. Being without Christ and not washing the blood, then you're dead in your sins. This message, what we usually preach to, we preach to congregations largely of saved people, awakened people. But we also preach to those that are spiritually dead. And this is another Example of uh, for those preachers are out there saying, "Oh, well, we got to walk by faith." We got to well, everybody that you're preaching to, or everyone that you invite into your building, your congregation, aren't all don't all have faith. So if you have a person that doesn't have faith, and they come to your congregation, and they have the coronavirus, then what 
what is that going to? Are you going to expose all the people that do have faith to that person? See, it doesn't work that way. See, sicknesses fall on the saved and the unsaved. And we've gone over that before again. But what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to open up with a word of prayer before the message. Heavenly Father, most high God, Lord Jehovah, we give you all the praise and the honor, Lord. All the praises due to you and all the glory because you deserve it, Lord. And let everything that we do and everything that we preach reflect the glory onto you and not us, Lord. We are nothing before you, Lord. We know, we know you have no equal, none like you. So we pray to you, Lord. We walk by faith and not by sight, Lord, waiting for that day when Jesus will return, Lord. But as we wait, Lord, we preach the gospel, we preach the goodness of God, and we rejoice in your name. We thank you for the washing of the blood. And if there's one today that hasn't been washed in the blood, and has not placed their faith in the one who can save them, Lord, let them not harden their heart, but hearken unto the words and the seeds that we as your ministers plant, that you can, will give the increase to. So in Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, I want to thank you again for uh, joining me in this webcast and the preaching, and now they're talking about opening back everything up, opening up the chaos again, that's what I call it, and uh, regardless on what the numbers say, and regardless on whether people are still uh, uh, coming down with the virus, or rather the trend is where people are still increasingly coming up with this virus, but they still want to open up the business, you see how money has gotten so many people locked down into being hungry that they don't rather they can't they don't care whether people die or are exposed to it as long as they're not exposed to it. Again, they're not gonna go out in the firing line, but they want other people to go out there and make their money. But more interestingly about this, that they have already in workings, so-called vaccine, they're working on a patent for a vaccine or a treatment, I would say, to help in this virus already. Now, they already had this, but I'm not going to get into conspiracy theories, not too much. But it's interesting that now they're talking about getting everybody vaccinated, mandating you vaccine, being vaccinated. Or making sure everybody say, now you got Bill Hates, I mean Bill Gates, you call him Bill Gates, but the eugenics Bill Gates, I didn't say humanitarian, the eugenics Bill Gates talking about just vaccinating everybody, or making sure everybody is tested. So what does that spell to people like Bill Hates, I mean Bill Gates? That means pharmaceutical companies and whoever comes up with this vaccine, the controllers and have the patent to this vaccine, are going to have a windfall of profit. Now, this little uh, $1,200 that they gave to the Americans, American citizens that they're still doling out, some of you, if you filed uh, in, for a paper check in 2018, 2019, you might be waiting four or five months, depending on your income. But this little stimulus that they gave you was to make sure that you're able to buy goods and services. See, Millionaires aren't going to get rich off of millionaires. They're going to get millionaire. They're going to get rich off of the masses. So they have to make sure the masses are still alive, so they can get rich off of somebody. So to give you enough to stay, say, listen, this. Where did this number come from? This twelve. Where did this come from in the budget? Out of two trillion dollars, they give every American. They say, not every American, but. Everyone that has a social security card number, basically, or active green card, they give you $1,200. Most individuals, I'm talking about single family, apartments or mortgages, houses, that doesn't pay the mortgage for one month. But they were figuring that they targeted that this was... This, 
epidemic was going to only last one month. So that's where they basically came up with that number. To hold you over, forget about the lecture, forget about your other bills and all that. We're going to take care of that. We're going to make sure people don't throw you out in the street within this period. And we're going to give you enough that you can stay, keep a house over your head. And then, look back to, I know they're working on another bill, but it was, look, the, the virus is real. And it's gotten a little out of hand and not according to the plan. So they adjusted the plan. So now that they're talking about additional stimulus. So again, what is, what is the stimulus going to do? Is this going to make anybody rich, this money that they're giving out to individuals? No. What it's going to do is give you enough money to keep spending, to keep the economy. It's all about the economy. It's not about the health of the people. The only one that's concerned about your health, eternally, physically, and eternally, spiritually, is God Almighty. So he, he's the stimulus plan that you need. Stop looking for the government. Stop looking for the uh, state. And stop looking for a lot of your religious organizations as being the panacea to your problems. It's only Jesus Christ. We don't worship a building and we don't worship a church, which is nothing but a gathering. But we worship the master. Now, with that said, I want to get into a message that might be a little sensitive to those who are in these movements, the so-called religious people that are raised on these movements and believe in these movements, and also these opposers. I want to continue on our message I've been teaching on, why our gospel, we're on baptism, which is going to take a little uh, bit of explaining to do so. That's why I'm going in so many different phases. This is the third phase or the third lesson I've given on baptism. And why our gospel on baptism? And I want to center this one on Holy Ghost baptism. Yes, Holy Ghost baptism. Now, the ones that are popularized in this Holy Ghost baptism is the Pentecostal, Apostolic, Holiness, and those type of movements are going to be adverse to this message. Those that have been raised in these sensational churches and it's not just them, but the sensational churches. In other words, where people are running up and down the aisle, you might be a little turned off on it. So what I want to do, and before, when I came up preaching, I would just let you, I just let the fire come out and tell you what it is. Repent, repent. But now I learned to soften the blow. Soften the blow of change because whenever you try to throw something on somebody and teach them, whether it's right or not, it represents change, and people do not like change. You have to be softened. You have to be won into change. You have to be convinced of the change. You have to have assurance in the change. People aren't just going to change their normal ways without you first educating them and making them comfortable with the change. So I realize that this message of Holy Ghost Baptism is going to touch a lot of people the wrong way. But what I want you to do in what a lot of people do and a lot of religious organizations don't do is think. Think, research, go behind me, follow along. Grab your, if you haven't by now, grab your Bibles and follow along. So I'm going to go over a message that you have to rightly divide to understand. So what I'm going to be doing is giving you a message on right parts so you on rightly dividing and how you make the scriptures harmonize. And not take a scripture and take it out of context. I always tell and always teach, never take a scripture out of context. Because if you take a scripture without and don't understand the context, everything else that you think you know about that scripture will only confuse you. If you take something out of context. So the scripture must be rightly divided. And that's what I'm going to do in this message. Concerning Holy, now I'm not going to be able to touch on all the areas of Holy Ghost baptism on my YouTube channel. I went over a few messages that dealt with the situation that are more centered and focused on some of the issues I'm going to be talking about. But this message is just a general all overview of where this Holy, what the Holy Ghost baptism is, what it was for, and what it's for, not, what it's not. And opposing some of the teachings that are out there about a Holy Ghost baptism. So, without further ado, if you have your Bibles, let's turn into the book of Mark. Mark, first 
chapter of Mark. And we're going to start right from verse 3. And we're going to read about the Holy Ghost baptism. And we're going to find out what the scriptures say about the Holy Ghost baptism. Again, again, I'm not going to bend or I'm not going to twist. And again, during your leisure and you trying to and you search seeking for truth. What I'm asking you to do is the scriptures that I don't touch on as far as the context of what I'm talking when I go to a scripture. I want you to continue to read so you understand the content. Read before and after the scriptures so you have to understand of and you can answer the basic questions. I always say answer the basic question. Who, what, why, how, and when. If you can answer those questions, that encompasses context. Once you can answer those questions, and some of the questions like the how and the why are the harder questions, but once you can answer the other questions, you will understand the context of the scripture. So I'm going to be touching on a few things that you might not know in detail. You might not be fully convinced. So it's up to you to continue to read and do your research on the scripture I'll go into. Now I'm going to be going to Mark 1. Starting off at Mark 1 and verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And this is a prophecy in another prophecy in Malachi. And this was the prophecy or the forerunner of what? The Messiah. The Moshiach. The Christ. The come. We know this is talking about John the baptizer. Or John the Baptist. Baptist won his last name. He was a baptizer, and that's what he was known for, was baptizing. And he preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, looking forward to the one. Now, John couldn't remit sins. God is the only one that can remit sins. But this baptism was for those that were before the cross and before the Messiah that were looking forward to help. It was a physical baptism, looking forward to help. A word of baptism. So, okay. Without that further ado, let's continue to read. Verse 4 says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, we know, and we'll go in later, baptism is for the, our water baptism now is for the remission of your sins. John, looking forward, preached and prophesied of the Messiah to come. That's very important. Now, I want to stop and pause right there because, again, there might be some that have not come into this knowledge and, again, don't know how to write and divide. John was a prophet. And I don't want you to take my word for it. But let's go into, hold your places there in Matthew 1. Let's go into the seventh chapter of Book of Luke. They established John as a prophet. This is important. Prophets do what? Prophet is a mouthpiece of God. So as a prophet received, he gave. So what a prophet was saying when he was prophesying was absolutely true and verifiable. That too. In that generation, it would be verifiable. So what John was, is about to preach is, will be verified in that generation of what he's saying. They will be able to see, or at least see, the, for, uh, the coming of the Messiah in that generation. And whatever else he prophesied would happen in that generation. So let's continue. John, or excuse me, Luke 7. We're going to go to Luke 7 and 28. And again, my statement was that John was a prophet. Now, in some of your writings... Some of your books, you have the red writing, which is supposed to signify the preaching of Jesus. This is considered red writing and the preaching of Jesus. So this is something that Jesus said. Now let's, let's see how Jesus talks about John the baptizer. Luke 7 and 28. For I say unto you, this is Jesus talking, among those, and he's talking to his disciples at this time. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is none, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. 
But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And the kingdom of God signifies the church to come or what the apostles would be in the church. The kingdom of God, which we are in now. Not after we die. The kingdom is now. So, we signify John is a prophet. So what John is saying, again, will be verifiable, and they will be able to see in that generation what he's prophesying, at least a type of what they were seeing. That's important, but I'll get into that later, type and antitype. But they'll be able to see in that generation something to verify that he is a prophet. So let's go back to Acts 1. So we're talking prophecy now. So I should be able to go into scriptures and find out where, what John is saying. I should be able to go into scriptures and find that where that actually happened. This again is rightly dividing the scripture. This isn't me picking and choosing, but I should be able to go into scripture. And what John is talking about, we'll be able to see that. Okay. So John is again is talking to, this is before Jesus came. So this is before there were any disciples of the Moshiach. So back in John, and I will, Mark, Mark, excuse me, back in Mark, chapter 1, verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That was the purpose of his baptism, looking forward. Verse 5 says, and they went out unto all, and there went out all unto the land of Judea and of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Again, John preached repentance. Repent, stop what you're doing, and look forward to the Messiah that is to come for your sins. We all, you, you, your sins need to be forgiven. And he is the forgiveness of the, he's the forgiver of sins, not John, nor his baptism. But his baptism was looking forward to the one that would, could forgive sins. Jesus is the one that forgives him, who is God. The only one can forgive, the Pharisees had it right, the only one, no one can forgive sins but God. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girl of skin about his lawns, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. Talking about the Messiah, the Moshiach. I indeed have baptized you, immersed you, with water. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. If you stop right there, you will be lost. And that's what a lot of the Pentecostal, holiness, apostolics do. They stop right there and don't want to continue on with the context of what he's talking about. John baptized with water. And a lot of, a lot of the false prophets in the Protestant religions say the same thing. Well, the actual baptism or the antitype baptism is a Holy Ghost or a spiritual baptism. Now, baptism is a spiritual, but water baptism is what God commanded you to do. Commanded you to do. To obey the gospel. Just like you go back into... 2 Kings, 2 Kings, the story of Naaman. The water that he went into, Naaman, was told to go into dip, to go in Jordan and wash seven times, dip seven times. The water was the water, but it was God's obedience that made it a spiritual. You understand? Made it spiritual. Water is water. Water is H-U-O. But it's God's obedience. Obedience to God. Excuse me. Obedience to God that made Naaman 
of his leper. I believe that's in 2 Kings 7. Don't quote me on that. I believe it's somewhere around there. But your obedience in the water baptism is what causes you to be saved. And it's by faith that we will, not by sight. So, in verse 8, I indeed baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So, and it came to pass, and verse 9 says, and it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw heavens open up and a spirit like a dove descend upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we know the story and we've taught this or been heard this before. Jesus was the anointed one. The anointed Messiah, that's what his name, that's what the Christ means. Christ is in his last name. The Moshiach is the anointed one. The Savior. The one that will remit sins. So now what, what I want to do is I want to rightly divide the scriptures. And I'm going to bring us up to where this revelation that John gave takes place. John gave the revelation here. Said, and again, the scripture that causes a lot of confusion is John baptized with water. Jesus, the one coming after him on the Messiah, Messiah was baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now... At this time, he's talking and he's talking to people that are looking forward to the coming of Messiah. That's why people were baptized, looking forward, that have first repented, admitted their sins, and that are looking forward to a Messiah to come. Or those that are learners in the Messiah. Or would be learners or disciples. Disciples of Christ are the ones that would be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And we're going to go right to the day of Pentecost and we're going to find out who was baptized. Now, let's go over the book of Luke. Luke 24. And we were here before, but a lot of different information in Luke 24. Now, this is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. After Jet, and now he's talking to who? Talking to his disciples, his learners, his students. This is important. That's why I went over that. Who John was preaching to. And who came out of that. Seven individuals that were baptized by John came out of that. And this would happen to the disciples, the students, the learners of the, Moshi the Moshiach. The Messiah, the Christ. So who is he talking? Who's Jesus talking to now? His learners. More important, his witnesses. Not Jehovah Witnesses, his true witnesses. His true, true Jehovah Witnesses. Luke 24 and verse 44. And he said unto them, Who are the them? The them or the they that John was talking about. The they that John was talking about are the disciples that Jesus is now talking to. So them are the disciples. And he said unto them, not unto everybody, not unto people in the field, he's telling to them. Jesus specifically talking to them. Who's being spoken to? That's important, again, in writing the Bible. Who's speaking? Jesus. Who's being spoken to? The them. The them is the disciples. And he's going to tell you the what. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things, and here's the why, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, John was one of them, and in the Psalms concerning me. Everything was pointing to him. The one John was pointing them, which are the disciples, 
to was to him. Not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Krishna, not Haile Selassie, not Drew Ali, not Elijah Muhammad, not Farrakhan, him. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Who was he opening understanding of? The disciples, apostles at this point. Because they were personally taught, commissioned by Christ. That's an apostle. Not these ones calling themselves apostles now. You had to be physically taught and commissioned. Physically, audibly, by Christ. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. That's the gospel, the good news. And that repentance and remission of sin. Wait a minute. Isn't that the same thing John preached? That's the same thing John's baptism was for? Repentance and a remission of sins? Well, Jesus is saying the same thing. His prophets see eye to eye. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in the name of, in, in his name among all nations, beginning at where? Jerusalem. We're going to get into that. It's beginning at this preaching will go forth from Jerusalem. But he's teaching his instructors, soon to be his ministers, his students. This is what I want, I'm commissioning you to do. And I want you to start this teaching at Jerusalem. And ye are my witnesses. See, I'm not just picking things out of the air. What I'm saying falls in line with Scripture. His witnesses, not Jehovah witnesses, the one knocking on your door. He didn't tell you to go in and knock on, he didn't tell them to go out and knock on people's door. He said, go to Jerusalem. This just teaching is going to start in Jerusalem. And ye are my witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you. So he's talking, what was the promise of his Father? The promise, and we won't get into this, but I'm just going to state and put it out there. And I'll prove me wrong if I'm wrong. The promise was unto them. The promise is what John prophesied, prophesied. John prophesied that I baptize you for water, with water. But this one coming after you is going to baptize you, my witnesses, my students, my disciples with the Holy Ghost. That was the promise. And this promise was unto them. Not me. Not you. Not Geno Jennings. Not E.W. Tooks. Not E.W. Kenyon. Not all these false prophets. Not John MacArthur. Uh, Charles Dobson. Rick Warren, and all these sensations out there, sensationalists, Billy Sunday, not to, these was unto the witnesses. These witnesses were eyewitnesses. These would be eyewitnesses at Jerusalem. So if you weren't an eyewitness at Jerusalem, that promise wasn't unto you. And this, pro, this happened already. Again, like I said, the prophecy that John gave would have to come forth, or at least the type would have to show in that generation, this is still in that generation. So that promise is going to come forth to them. He's talking to them. And the them were the they that John was talking about that were be baptized by the Holy Ghost. That was the promise. And you are my witness of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you. And the ones that are told the promise... We're told this next thing. Because this is important for the apostolics out there that are getting warts on their knees and no, warts and bruises on their knees tearing for the Holy Ghost. And behold, I send the promise of my Father to you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Power from on Holy Ghost power. Now, who was told, again, this is how you write and divide, answer the question. Who, what, why, how, when? Answer those questions 
and you'll be able to understand context. Who was told to tarry? The them. Who were the them? The them are the disciples or apostles. Who are the apostles? The ones that are, were looking forward to the Messiah. The ones that John preached to that said would be baptized by the Holy Ghost. They are the them that Jesus is talking to. Then told to tarry. He didn't tell anybody else to tarry. He told them to tarry. And when you're tarrying, for all those who still want to believe in that, you have to tarry in Jerusalem. So if you believe this is to you, you have to what? Tarry in Jerusalem until you endure with power from on high. Not in your church, not in your organization, not among your assembly, not at Bro in Broad Street, on 5th Street and Broad Street, and not in any of your organizations that have you with the sensational movement. Now, again, let me take it down a little bit. Because I know again, this is a sensitive issue for a lot of people. A lot of people might turn me off at this point and say, that man don't know what he talking about. Oh, he just don't know. Or, he just ain't got the Holy Ghost. He ain't caught the Holy Ghost yet. Like you catch a cold. You don't catch the Holy Ghost. What this Holy Ghost was is a promise to them. You can keep waiting for the sensationalism or this experience or God to just take over your body. It's not going to happen. God takes over your spiritual mind. God never takes away your free will to obey. or dis God doesn't make you obey. He doesn't make you love him. Because it wouldn't be love if he forced you to love him. So you can obey and disobey. That's why the angels are in quandary and say, what is man that thou art mindful? This one that can disobey what you tell him to do? Just real quick, real, real fast. Man has the ability to disobey. But you know when Jesus went to the demons the gather, and the gatherings, the man that was in the, uh, they had all the legion of demons. When he came to those demons, those demons knew who he was. They said, what, have you come to torment us before our time? They knew who he was. But Jesus told them not to speak, and they didn't. But you know who did speak when Jesus told them not to? Man. Man, Jesus would heal people and say, don't tell them my time is, but they would still go and speak. Man had the ability to disobey. And even those demons didn't disobey. But I'm, what I'm saying here is that people are waiting for an emotional experience. Now, you can have joy without running down the aisle or getting highly emotional. We worship by faith, not by sight. Not by emotion. Your emotions can do a lot of it. No. You know why they have those stories called the wine spirits? Because when you drink that, what they call the fire water, the Indians call it the fire water, it'll change your mood. Some people are in a sad mood and be in a happy mood when you deal with those, when you deal with alcohol or all the drugs. That's, that'll change your emotions. But it's pseudo. Just like a lot of the false prophets out there are selling you false hope. Now, I know for the longest, here in America especially, people were taught to believe in the scriptures, which you should do, but don't question anything that the preacher says. Whatever the Bible says, don't question it. And don't question the preacher. First of all, there's nothing in the scripture, and the scripture that actually invites you to question. Question the scriptures. Try it. See if he won't prove you wrong. Or prove himself right. You can try and question. Try to poke holes into the Bible. It's been done by many people for many years. Try to poke holes in the scriptures. And what you'll find out is that this is God-breathed. And anointed of God. But again, you've been told not to question your preachers. And what my ministry and many 
Brothers in the Church of Christ ministry is centered on is educating individuals. First of all, after you're saved, it tells them to teach them again, teaching them to become disciples in Matthew 28, 19. Teach them, baptize them, and teach them to observe. That part of observing is educating your mind, freeing, liberating your mind from the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's Romans 12. You have to change your mind, and you have to liberate your mind from the oppressor's teachings. The oppressor's teaching. Now, we know who's behind the, the, the oppressor is the devil. But the devil has ministers out there. You have to liberate your mind, especially here in America, and a lot of European countries that had slaves, liberate your mind from the slave teaching on don't question what we say. Remember the Dark Ages? Go back and read the Dark Ages where no one was allowed to read the scriptures but the, the priest of God. Liber this, with all this information out here now, you have the ability to research. And when I call something out and say the Greek says this and harmatia is to Mr. Martin, you have the right and you have the it, it, finger accents to do a Google search and look up the word harmatia and you'll find out and you can do... Uh, the word origin, where that word was an archer's term as in missing the mark, and that's what your sin is, or, or attempts of righteousness are, missing the mark, you can look that up. So you can do the research, and I implore you, I beg you, to follow behind what I'm saying, and do the research, so you can educate your own mind. And, I also implore you, to question. Ask questions. Listen, 99.99% of all problems, I would say 100%. Let, let me go over this. If I'm wrong, say I'm wrong. 100% of problems or misunderstandings are cleared up through the process of question and answer. They go together, question and answer. Not just asking questions. A lot of people want to ask questions but never get the answer. Or you ask the question and the person doesn't give the answer. That doesn't mean you stop asking. You keep asking individuals into what? You find the answer. This is what Jesus said, talking about seeking and you shall find. Ask questions. So when these preachers told you not to ask questions, they didn't want you to question them because if you question them, you will find out there's no such thing as a curse of ham. This blend black is not a curse. See, that's the teaching that was taught. And what I'm getting at is this teaching of sensationalism, running up and down the aisle, was given to you by the slave master. I know some of you don't like it. So a lot of what we were taught, a lot of our grandmamas, our abuelas, our poppies, or what they, the, uh, that, that, what's the name of uh, um, Derek Smith? Surgeon General. What he said. A lot of that was taught to them was handed down from the slave master. And it's still taught in the church. So, we need to liberate your mind and get the education yourself. Get the information yourself. Now, I'm not talking about getting, you won't get saved that way. And it's not through knowledge that you Become into the knowledge of Christ, but you can understand and be able to rightly divide the scriptures with knowledge on how to do it. You can do the research in the scripture. The King James Version is not a perfect translation. I'm going to say it again. And this is for another message. I've done messages on this again on my YouTube. The King James Version is not a perfect translation, nor is the NIV, neither is the New King James, New World Trans. They're not perfect translations. And the English that was spoken, the middle Elizabethan English that was spoken in King James, we don't speak that way. So that's why we have to get context and understand context. And sometimes you have to go back to the original so you understand context. That's the only reason for this. So again, back to my message. The ones that were told to tarry in Jerusalem were the disciples, the apostles. At this time, there was a letter. 
Why were there only 11? When it was prophesied, it should be 12, representing 12 tri tribes of Israel, or Yisrael. Why 12? 12 tribes. 12 witnesses. But now there's 11. So, the scriptures must need be fulfilled. So with that, I'm going to pick up in the book of Acts. Again, this is all heart in harmony and rightly dividing the scriptures. And we're, we're working up there. We're getting up there. I'm going to land the ship real quick. Acts 1. Now, do your research and continue on Acts 1 so that you get the context. But I'm going to state something without reading everything. That the ones, the them that are in Acts 1 are the them that were in Luke 24. The them that were in Luke 24 were the apostles. And the, those thems that were in Luke 24 were the them, were they, that John was prophesying about. So those people are the same thems that are in Acts 1. I don't know if I said that right. But they're the same people. Acts 1. And I'm going to go all the way down to the point where they're about to point Matthias to be the 12th of the them. And I'm going to go down to Acts 1 and about 12. Yeah, that's a good place. Acts 1 and 12. And then, and then return they. The they's of them, the ones in Acts 1, you know, they're the same ones. And they return unto Jerusalem. Now, where were they told to tarry at in Luke 24? Jerusalem. So that they are where they were told to be to wait at in Jerusalem. And they returned unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olive which is in Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into the upper room. Now, who's the one in the upper room at the time? The twelve, just then. And they went up, and they went, and excuse me, and when they were come in, they went up into the upper room, and were bold, both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the brother of James. Now, anyone you can count, that's 11. They need one more. And there were the ones that Jesus was talking to about. Talking to in Luke 24. These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, the eleven. And said, the number of the names together were about 120. Men and brethren, these scriptures must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by filled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David, excuse me, David spake before concerning Judas, which was God to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst of all his bowels gushed out. And it came and it was known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem in so much as they Field, the, that field is called their proper dialogue, Alcildama. That is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric another take. 
So in other words, there had to be another disciple. So you can read on that disciple, that 12th one that was added, was one that was there from the beginning, that was taught by Jesus, and was with them from the very first, from the teaching of John until then. And one of, that one that they chose was the lot fellow on Matthias. So now we have the 12. Now we have the 12. Now we have the 12 in, this, in Jerusalem that were told to wait at Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So we have the 12. Now here's where the prophecy is fulfilled. Acts 2. And one. Just go over one. Acts 2 and 1. And when the day of Pentecost was, which is four Sabbaths plus one. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Excuse me, I, I said that wrong about Pentecost. That's a, Pentecost means 50. So it's plus 1. 7, 7. 7 times 7 plus 1. So Pentecost, I said that wrong. But anyway, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there were all, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, they're not talking about the 120. They're talking about the 12. The 12 who received the promise were all in one court in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues again like as of fire and it sat upon each of them Rightly divided. Now, how do we rightly divide? Answer the questions. Who, what, how, when, why. Who are the them? Who's the antecedent to them? We went over it several times in this message on who the them are. Who did the clothing to the clothes appear on? The them. Not everybody, not the 120, not all the devout ones, them. And suddenly there came sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared, un and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as in a fire and it sat upon each of them, the apostles. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That is a Holy Ghost baptism. The Holy Ghost baptism only appeared two times in the scriptures. Yes, two times. Here the day of Pentecost and the house of Cornelius. That's the only two times. And that represented Jew and Gentile. That's the only two times. Now, the only ones who got the Holy Ghost baptism were the them. And the only one that was promised to were the them that John was talking about. The ones that Jesus was talking, that told the tower, and the ones that are there on the day of Jerusalem, that received the promise that was given to them, which were the twelve apostles. They received the Holy Ghost baptism. I can go further into the dialogue, um, into the scriptures of, of chapter 2. There's a lot more teaching in there, but I'm going to cut it off because the message is now over an hour. Uh, and Lord willing, I'll be able to continue on with more teaching on baptism. But this Holy Ghost baptism, first of all, was not for salvation. Anybody tells you that you have to catch the Holy Ghost, you got to get the Holy Ghost, and speak with other tongues to be saved, that's not taught in the Scripture. Jesus never taught that. Disciples never taught that. And there's no example they can give that says someone was saved because they were baptized by the Holy Ghost. No, you're saved through your obedience and the operation is done by God. 
to you, to add you into the church. Your act of obedience is hearing the word, believing in that word, repenting of your sins, confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, accepting him as the Moshiach. He used to say, he's the one that can remit your sins. And being baptized in water for the remission of sins. After this preaching that Peter got, at the end, Acts 2.38, Peter stood up and says, Repent, every one of you. Now, if they were already saved, they wouldn't have had to do that. Repent, every one of you, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. That baptism was for the remission of your sins. Or out of obedience. You're saved by your faith. Saved through faith. By God. But he tells you what to do and to be water baptized. Not Holy Ghost baptism. He didn't tell him everyone to be Holy Ghost baptism. Or, you know, you already caught the Holy Ghost, so you don't need any more, anything else. The ones, first of all, the ones that got the Holy Ghost baptism were only the twelve that were commissioned and taught by Jesus. That's a lesson for another, a debate for another lesson, or one that I've already gone over in my YouTube channel. But the ones that got it were the twelve. And that baptism wasn't for their salvation or the remission of their sins. The Holy Ghost baptism was to be endued with power on high. That was the promise that John gave. So Lord willing, I hope you got something out of this message. Pray that everyone is saved. Keep Brother Darius in pray, prayer. Uh, he wasn't able to make it. He's, he's going through some uh, extreme difficulties, as many of us are now uh, during this time. But uh, keep him in prayer. I spoke to him this morning. And keep everybody in prayer, especially those in the household of faith, as we must pray for them together. Keep me in prayer. Um, let us pray now and end the service. Heavenly God, Father, Lord Jehovah, we thank you, Lord, for another blessed day that you allow us to come forth and broadcast this message. And Lord, if you wanted to, thousands could hear this message, millions could hear this message and repent this day. And obey the gospel. Lord, let you get the glory out of all things and out of us. And that no flesh should glory in your presence. But Lord, let all the glory reflect it and back to you, Lord. We lift up your holy name as the one and the only source of our salvation. And the only one that we place faith in. Not placing faith in anything of this world. Not placing any faith in man or ourselves. We're placing faith in the one who created us and the one that's able to destroy our body and soul and spirit. We thank you, Lord, and we look forward to your coming, Lord. And as we look forward, Lord, in this vapor of the earth, in this life that we have on this earth, we continue to rejoice in your name and preach the goodness of God. In Jesus, or Yeshua's name, that we humbly pray. Amen. Thank you once again for listening to another broadcast. And pray the Lord that uh, got something out of this message. And you will continue to follow in the pathway of God.